Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, uh, everyone here in person and online. I, uh, I'll just start by introducing myself briefly. Uh, my name is Sarah Jordan. I'm an associate professor um, here in the Department of Civil Engineering, but also uh, with the Trachi Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design, which I'll introduce shortly. And I will be leading the discussion today on uh, the new uh, Masters of Engineering uh, in Sustainability and Engineering and Design. Um, and so uh, we're really looking forward to uh, talking about this with you today. We have a number of professors who will be speaking on behalf of their courses. And uh, let's start just by talking a little bit about TISED. So Trati Institute for Sustainability and Engineering and Design is also known as TISED. Uh, it was founded in 2012 in McGill's Faculty of Engineering. There are over 65 members from across the faculty and beyond and uh, representing interdisciplinarity across departments. Uh, the administrative team, uh, we oversee the uh, institute's programs and initiatives. Uh, there is a director, Professor Supashish Goshal. Um, I will be the graduate program director of the new program that we'll be talking about today. And we have a fantastic um, staff. Uh, we have, I think Monica is online, Parisa is here. Uh, who's communications, the TISED manager in communications, and uh, Gladys, you'll see uh, those of you who are here in person, uh, she is a uh, student affairs administrator. Uh, we also have an admin coordinator, Irene, and an industry liaison who will be starting in the spring of 2024, who will play in a really important role for all of these, you who are interested in the program. So the, uh, just as a, a quick note uh, on TISED's mission, this will explain a little bit about uh, the program more broadly. Uh, the mission of TISED is to catalyze and enable sustainability research, uh, also to advance sustainability education. So this program is integral to that component of uh, TISED's mission. To engage in public outreach, so we do a number of different uh, forums by which we do that. Uh, and then we also host forums for, uh, for host fora for policy discussions. So let's talk a little bit about the program. Uh, it's very exciting to be launching that this year. Uh, so the program is the first of its kind in Canada. Uh, what's unique about it is that it's housed within engineering, but it also offers a more holistic uh, versus discipline-specific training, uh, which encompasses sustainability metrics, analysis, systems thinking, and collaborative design. So you might see parts of that in other programs, that this is bringing it all together under one umbrella, which also includes really critical aspects of really making uh, change happen through understanding the social, policy, and economic aspects of sustainability. So these are really important things uh, in order to really be change making in today's society in sustainability for engineering and design for your professional. Another important component, and it is multidisciplinary. So you'll not only have a, a, a very solid foundation in sustainability concepts, you'll see that in the courses, but you'll also have additional rigor and expertise in this program by specialization in uh, the, the four streams. So key highlights uh, to note that uh, really uh, will make this program stand out is first we have, uh, we will be having opportunities uh, for experiment, experiential learning. Uh, so that is, of course, embedded within our teaching. But in addition to that, uh, we have research courses, which provide research opportunities, workshops, uh, professional networking opportunities, uh, industry, guest lectures, as well as site visits. For example, I took a group of students this semester to go on the hydrogen train up in Quebec, uh, near Quebec City. Uh, with, there's also going to be optional summer internships, so this will provide students in the program with practical experience. Uh, and in doing so, so you can go out and actually get some job experience in addition to the other uh, um, aspects of the program. So in 
the, with the summer internships, uh, there is, uh, the students in the program are eligible for a graduate internship program uh, here at McGill. But also, when the industry liaison is hired, there will be someone who will be working to directly connect students to opportunities. So in terms of the program details and requirements, it is a course-based uh, non-thesis master's, so there is no supervisor involved. It's 45 cr uh, credits, so there are 27 credits for the required courses, and for the complementary courses, there are 18 credits. You can only start at one time during the year in fall, and the duration is 16 months. So that would be fall, winter, and fall, and it is full-time. Just to to, as a highlight as well, even though it is course-based, there still is opportunity for, uh, for completing research through the research courses. So here's the program structure, just highlighting the core courses. Um, we are going to have professors introduce, including myself, introduce uh, the courses shortly. Um, but you can see that it's uh, well uh, laid out here. So we have foundations for sustainability and engineering design, energy, and this is, uh, this is taught uh, by Bruce Lowry. Um, energy analysis, which is by uh, Jeff Bergtherson, uh, life cycle based environmental footprinting, myself. The complementary courses that you see here, you can choose from a number of different streams to get more specialized um, uh, knowledge. The winter uh, 530, uh, economics and for sustainability and engineering and design. That's Gary. I'll be teaching seed uh, 540, which is industrial ecology and systems. Uh, 550, which is Decision Making for Sustainability and Engineering and Design, which is taught uh, by Professor Lakshmi Shushima, who isn't here today. And then again, the choice of complementary courses, which will enhance more uh, specified expertise. And then finally, Strategies for Sustainability and Collaborative Design for Sustainability being the last two courses along with uh, the additional complementaries. So in terms of the program structure, I did mention streams. So there are four streams. So the first being sustainable, well, they could be in any order, but the first listed here is sustainable processes and manufacturing. We also have renewable energy and energy efficiency, sustainable urban development, and sustainable infrastructure. So students can choose courses from up to two of these streams. And this is to really help you gain very important specific expertise uh, that can help you in your careers and beyond. So I'm going to uh, pass to the current instructors. So there's a number of them here. Uh, so I am one of them. I'm going to actually uh, go last. Um, maybe Jeff, we can start with you. Uh, so we can just go through and the instructors will introduce their courses. Uh, we'll start with Jeff and then Gary and then Bruce and then I'll finish up. And I'll pass you this here. There's no slides for this, though, right? No, no, no slides. Okay, yeah, so energy analysis, seed 510. It's a broad course really looking at uh, what we call the 30,000-foot view of our energy system. What is our energy system today? What does it look like? Where do we get our energy from? What do we need to, um, what, what are the problems with that? Uh, so climate change obviously being one of them and there's other challenges associated with the current energy uh, mix. And then what, um, what are the types of metrics that we would use to assess renewable energy technologies that would be the transition towards a sustainable future? Um, so we want to understand what are the metrics to assess that, what are the different types of options that are out there, and then understand how can we assess trade-offs between what do we decide to put in solar panels or wind turbines or geothermal, how do we decide between these different types of technologies. Um, and so the course is really based around, um, and then we look also at energy storage um, and, uh, and uh, production of, say, clean fuels from um, from those renewable energy sources. And the course is really structured around three projects. So the three projects are to do, a, first of all, an assessment of your own energy usage and understand um, your energy footprint and its impacts on the environment. Then the second project is to look at, uh, propose, to propose or to uh, advise on a renewable energy project for a specific application. So 
different teams will pick different renewable energy technologies and then they have to assess it with all of those tools that we've brought in. So the economics, the life cycle um, impacts and, uh, and the various other metrics that we talk about, uh, things like energy return on investment and, and, um, and other energy metrics. From that understanding of th those topics, then they propose or uh, recommend against that renewable energy project for that specific application. And then the last project includes uh, an assessment of energy storage technologies for different types of applications, like uh, balancing day to night for solar or, or for wind um, for seasonal variations or for backup energy generation. So that, that ties to all of the different aspects of the energy system. And with those projects, and the students are getting also those experiential learnings, uh, group work and uh, presentation skills training as, as well as part of the course. So I think that's it. Good? Thank you. No, no, no plus. Thanks so much. Hopefully I don't put it too close to him. All right, so hello, I'm Gary. I'm the course lecturer for C530, uh, sustain Economics for Sustainability and Engineering Design. So as Sarah mentioned, this program deals with engineering, but has a more holistic point of view. So we have Bruce's course about the fundamentals, and we have my course, which is an economics course about sustainability. The expectation is that uh, as engineers, you don't have previous knowledge of economics to a high degree. So this course, was, my course starts from the basics. We'll start from you know, looking at classical economics, behavioral economics, and environmental economics. So we start from the basics. We start from supply and demand. We talk about what a market is. We, and then we talk about market mechanisms, like, you know, how does, like, what happens with taxes, what happens with tariffs. One of the topics that we'll cover is obviously very controversial, but it's Canada's carbon tax. And we talk about how that will affect what happens out there, especially for engineers. So there's a, this course has a focus on sustainability issues and SDGs. So we cover the basics, and then in the second half of the course, we start keying in on the individual sustainability development goals, and we talk about the economics of that. So uh, we also have uh, outside people, experts coming in. Last year, I invited speakers from GebSP, so there is an opportunity to engage with industry people and talk about issues such as externalities, like how do companies price in environmental issues into economics, which is something that classical economics really doesn't cover. So we're going to try to build from that and talk about the value of the environment. So evaluation, uh, we try to make it topical. The first assignment I had was uh, assignment on LED cer lead certification. So we're trying to have you go around Montreal, find a building that's LEED certified, and then we talk about the, how a building gets certified and then make the linkages, the economic linkages about it. Like, why, what's the rationale for LEED certification? What's the economic benefits? Uh, then I had them uh, assignment about Canada's move towards electric vehicles. Canada's mandated that all vehicles sold by 2035 have to be non-combustion has to be electric and I had an assignment where we dealt with it. What does Canada need to happen for us to be able to drive all electric vehicles in 2035? How much energy do we need? What type of infrastructure do we need? And how much will it cost us? And finally, uh, we have the midterm on economic theory. And finally, uh, at the end, we have a full term project and a presentation, and I asked students to do a market analysis. So I asked them to pick a product or service, and then I asked them to write a report and that builds up on all the material that we learned at. So you identify the product, you identify who the competitors are, you, you identify substitutes, complements, 
uh, you identify the marketplace. And as I said, it's, it's a hands-on way for you to learn about market structure, competition, and, uh, and I think it was pretty good. So that's uh, more or less the crux of my course. And if you have any questions afterwards from here the audience or from the audience outside, uh, I'll be here to answer them. So thank you very much. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, sorry, I forgot about that rush. So, uh, Laxmi Shusharma is, is the professor for, do I talk about 550 or 550 and her 515 course? You know, if you could just introduce them both briefly, okay. that would be great. All right, so the, the, the course that's part of the curriculum, the required curriculum is Seed 550, which is uh, Decision Making for Sustainability and Engineering Design. And of course, the topics in her course that she covers strategies and methods for decision making and sustainability. Like, what type of tools do you use to make good decisions when you're talking about sustainability? So, she brings in different concepts such as game theory, uncertainty analysis. Uh, she talks about sustainability metrics. She brings in a little LCA, which is part of your course. And uh, her evaluations, typical. Uh, she has assignments, exams, and the final term project and presentation. And one year I sat in on her course, her final class, and she had uh, the whole class on the final week put up posters. And it became a very big event where groups went from one poster to the other posters and uh, explained their posters to their colleagues. So that was a very good experience. As for the other course, Seed 515, this is a course that's offered in the fall. It's not a required course, it's a complementary course. It's the only complementary seed course. And it's called Climate Change Adaptation in Engineering Infrastructure. And of course, it deals with climate resilience and the sustain sustainability of infrastructure. And there's a focus on the built environment. So her experience allows her to teach the course with a focus on the Canadian North. So she talks about the effects of climate change, which is quite apparent to all of us. So you know, uh, we talk. Her course talks about the imp how to deal with the impacts. We have uh, melting of the polar ice up north. We have melting of the permafrost, and then you have the subsequent f flooding. So when you have issues such as this and other issues that also affect the Canadian South. What type of strategies do you develop to adapt to this climate change or to mitigate this climate change? And this is the crux of her, her 515 course. Yeah. So now I hand it off to Bruce. Can get this off. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bruce Laurie. I'm a professor of practice here at McGill, so I'm not um, a formally um, full-time professor here, but I come in periodically, and uh, I was very fortunate last or earlier this year to be a scholar in residence where I got to know the program and meet the professors, and um, I was just really excited to be able to play a role in, uh, in this new program. So. I am teaching uh, the course that is uh, Seed 500, Foundations for Sustainability in Engineering and Design. And um, I'm, as a professor of practice, that means I work on sustainability and have for 30 years in the field every day. And so what I'm trying to do is link the um, sort of more the, the theoretical side and the early understanding of sustainability. What are the definitions of sustainability? What are the struggles with it? Where have we gotten? and then apply that in a very practical way to different aspects of sustainability. So we actually touch on many of the different things that have been discussed. Um, of course, things like climate change, which are a huge issue. Um, <clears throat> we talk a little bit about um, agriculture in the class that I have right now. There's a lot of interest in um, urban design and urban infrastructure, so we're talking about that. Um, and basically, it's really, from, from my perspective, we start off with um, uh, was called the World Commission on Environment and Development, which really was the, the report that defined sustainability for the world in 1992, so 30 years ago. 
and then um, and then I'm using that tr as basically to sort of root our conversations and try to understand, you know, what have we learned since then, um, what is working well or not working well in sustainability, and um, and then how do we bring in some of the other tools that are going uh, being described in greater depth around. Um, LCA metrics, measurement uh, of sustainability, and then a big part of sustainability is the role of stakeholders and the role of collaboration. And um, um, I might have to um, uh, yeah, talk about, where was the one that had uh, collaboration in the title? Um, but there's a, there's a whole, ultimately, <clears throat> as I'm presenting it, for most of the big sustainability issues, fundamentally you have to figure out how to collaborate to come up with sustainability solutions. So that means working with civil society. In Canada, if you're building energy projects, it very often, almost always these days, means working with indigenous communities. It means working with business, working with government. There's a policy element to it. And so through my career over the last 30 years, I've worked on lots of big collaborative sustainability projects. And I'm, um, I'm able to bring in a number of uh, great colleagues for this, uh, for this. We're doing it in an intensive course, I should mention. So it's over a two-week period, so very intense. And, um, but uh, uh, almost every, well, about every second uh, chunk has a, a guest speaker. And some of them are academics, someone's an expert in stakeholder work, someone's an expert in um, kind of civil society. Um, one of them is an engineer who's gone, done everything from being a tech entrepreneur to uh, an energy systems modeler at a consulting firm. And so my idea is to really try to make sustainability, uh, sustainability feel real for students and then give them insights into what are the jobs that are out there and um, how that might, uh, you know, how might um, you know, help students really figure out what's a role for them. And as I said in the opening class, these days in sustainability, when I started a million years ago, I started my consulting company 30 years ago in sustainability, which seemed like an obvious thing to, for me 30 years ago. Now it's where you look back and so, say, wow, like, there wasn't really a lot going on. Um, on the ground, <clears throat> but the reality is today you could be working in a bank, working in an engineering consulting firm, working for a big manufacturing firm, like there's so many opportunities for sustainability, so I'm trying to really present, you know, what is the realm that people can be working in because it's, it's, it's quite vast and there's huge opportunity and I think this is, this really is the future for anyone that wants a great job, so I'm, I'm very, uh, very keen on the, on the course. So we're really obviously very lucky to have each of the uh, professors and instructors involved with this program with uh, really exciting courses. Um, I'm teaching two courses associated with the, prog uh, the program. The first is life cycle based environmental footprinting. So you heard LCA be mentioned a few times from uh, different speakers. Uh, life cycle assessment is a tool that quantifies environmental burdens of products and processes from cradle to grave or materials extraction through waste disposal. So that sounds quite like it could be something that's simple, but it's actually very complex and it requires vast amounts of databases and information in order to do it correctly. So you can imagine you could look at anything, for example, a battery uh, for, uh, from an electric vehicle. Each and every component that went into that battery has an impact and was extracted from the ground. So it involves actually quantifying emissions and impacts from each and every component all the way through waste disposal. Now, I use that example uh, for a reason. This class is very much fundamentally based on active learning. So in every class you'll walk in, I know there's one of my students here, uh, so every class you walk in, I'll lecture a little bit, but I like for the students to be able to work together on specific pro uh, problems. So that might entail everything from uh, discussing uh, the life cycle specific products together to actually um, completing LCAs in the lab. So we provide students with databases to actually conduct the analysis. And uh, even participating in simulations where they're part of an economy so that they better understand the interactions and transactions across supply chains. Right now, I mentioned the battery, the students are actually working in groups to determine uh, how life cycle assessment results, so this full sustainability impacts, uh, change if you implement a circular economy solution uh, for electric vehicle batteries. 
So they're right now undertaking a group project on that, and much like Gary mentioned in a prior course, they'll be presenting posters in groups. So they're right now working in teams with a number of databases to try to figure out how to solve some problems associated with really important uh, transitions to low carbon. So uh, that's the first course I'm teaching. The second one is Seed 540, which is industrial ecology. So this course uh, essentially focuses on the fundamentals of industrial ecology, so key tools. Life cycle assessment is one, but one of many. So it includes uh, aspects such as material flow analysis, so understanding um, how materials are, how many materials are produced, for example, in nations, uh, aspects of industrial symbiosis or recycling and circular economy, so how to reduce wastes, uh, materials accounting, um, urban systems, so how to think through reducing uh, waste in urban systems and also making waste into products. So a large part of thinking through industrial ecology is you might have some type of waste from one system. Is there a way that you can change that into a resource in another system? Uh, it also employs uh, economic tools to better understand that. And uh, similar to, uh, the to Seed 520, which is fo focused on life cycle assessment techniques, uh, you, the students will actually also be working in groups and on practical problems will they be engaging in the material in each class, uh, working independently and in groups. And there will be a team project. I'm right now thinking about it. I believe it's going to be on materials criticality. Uh, so we do have some specific resources, for example, that are required for an, an, an the present energy transition that might become scarce. So the students will be working in groups thinking about how to solve some of those questions. So those are the courses. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, uh, in applying, uh, the, there are some admissions requirements. So we are focused specifically on programs uh, that are housed within uh, the Faculty of Engineering here at McGill. So that means you would be required to have a bachelor's degree in engineering, urban planning, or architecture, or equivalent. So there are some cases where uh, bachelor of science graduates, for example, uh, will be considered. Uh, minimum GPA, CGPA of three out of four, and the last two terms, 3.2 out of four. Uh, English profici proficiency uh, with, um, with the scores noted here for either the TOEFL or IELTS. Uh, so those are necessary for those who are, do not have English as a first language. Uh, how to apply, so you would submit an online application so you can visit the website. Uh, the support, there's a number of supporting documents, so that would be the transcripts um, for all institutions that, that attended. Uh, not including high school or CJEP, two letters of reference, your curriculum vitae, and a, personal, a one page personal statement. And um, it describes here what would be required, such as uh, research interests um, and then the program streams, et cetera. And as mentioned, the English language proficiency. So the applications are presently open. We already have a number of applications, uh, so it's looking like it's going to be an exciting, um, exciting ramping up of the program. Uh, the application deadline is January 15th uh, for ad fall admission for the upcoming year. And as mentioned previously, there is no winter admission. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time to go over some frequently asked questions uh, that may come up. So one might be, do I have to choose a stream at the time of application? Uh, you actually don't, so you might be interested in a number of the streams. Uh, so in that particular case, you may come in. Uh, of course, you have to add some interest in your, in your statement. Um, but here you, would, uh, you can choose once after you arrive. Because this is a thesis-based program, you do not have to contact a supervisor before applying, like research-based programs. Um, and you can upload your official transcripts as they are made available to you. Uh, at the t and so that is if you're wondering about uh, the official transcripts at the time of application, because sometimes it doesn't always correspond. So there's another question. Um, can I still apply if I do not complete my current degree by the application deadline? Well, you have to complete your degree before starting the program. So if you're still in a program, that's fine, but you'll have to finish beforehand. Uh, and similarly, um, 
Similarly, for master's degrees, they must submit their initial thesis. Another question is, can I still apply if I don't have an undergraduate degree in engineering, architecture, or urban planning? Um, so students with uh, BSc, for example, in uh, physical sciences, um, earth sciences, or math and computer sciences group will also be considered. Uh, so if you come from these types of sciences, uh, you're, you're very welcome to apply or to reach out and to ask us more questions. And there is another question that uh, has been asked to our mid staff quite a bit too. Uh, if you're already registered in an MEng degree, uh, can you transfer? Um, McGill does not have a transfer system, even for McGill students. So you have to apply like the rest, and still, and that will, and you will still have to meet all of the programs and residency requirements. Um, in terms of transfer credits, uh, these uh, can um, there. They can be applied if the courses already exist, but a lot of this will be at the discretion of the GPD, who happens to be me, so I will be reviewing those um, requests as they come in. In terms of funding opportunities, uh, there is some limited uh, TYSED student support, so this will be offered on a competitive basis at the time of acceptance or before the program. Uh, there are no additional forms that are required, and they will be decided collectively as uh, decision, final decisions are made. There are also, um, and I've been a mentor to some of these scholars as well, the McCall McBain Scholarships, which is a really excellent opportunity, so I encourage all of you to uh, check out that program as well. Uh, and uh, you can um, admit, uh, you can uh, submit your application a year prior to the, the term of admission. So certainly important to check that out for this in coming years. And in terms of job opportunities, as Bruce mentioned, uh, sustainability is really everywhere. I even was uh, having conversations with um, investment banks earlier today, even insurance streams. There's across um, environmental organizations. So here's a few examples of what you might uh, become involved with. There was, there's a lot of different pr uh, public and private sector opportunities. Uh, so sustainability consultant and environmental advisor. There's a lot and in growing interest in finance, which is very exciting. So all ESG uh, related matters require additional information of, uh, there's a, uh, for example, as I mentioned today, I was speaking to some insurance um, departments in investment banks who are interested in understanding uh, what environment, uh, what, how the energy transition might impact um, their insurance programs and how that could actually also help to promote specific uh, changes uh, in, in, in improvements in broader societal sustainability, uh, as well as innovation. So where do you invest your money uh, and how do you advance uh, technologies? Of course, sustainability directors and uh, there's always opportunities in uh, engineering to enhance thinking around how to design better for the environment and sustainability and to understand and improve the impacts of existing operations. So I'm gonna stop there uh, for a few minutes and invite questions, and the questions you can ask me. Uh, I believe we also have uh, our program manager online. Uh, we also do, uh, also feel free to ask questions to the instructors, but I'll pause here in case we have any, and, and please do feel free to ask questions for those online as well. Yes. Um, I'm one of the students who isn't in like um, engineering undergraduate degree, one of the other ones. I was wondering kind of how heavy would you say the engineering components of the two courses are, and if that would be all right without that like engineering background. Yeah, and what, what Sarah, what program are you urban in? Studies. You're in urban studies? Um, so you're in the faculty of engineering in the urban planning I'm, department? Um, there's no urban planning under, like undergraduate. Okay, so, so in urban right. studies. Okay, got you. Um, so. What I would suggest is that you can choose your stream of interest in line with what you expect you will, uh, are best aligned with your interests. Of course, if you look through a stream and you determine that a lot of them are more advanced engineering and require a background, then there might be certain streams that might not be best applied to you. But as you saw, there is um, uh, a stream that's specifically focused on urban systems. Um, 
So, so I would recommend uh, taking some time to look through the specific courses and choose your program accordingly. In terms of the courses, the SEED courses, they have been designed to be accessible to students who are coming in from different backgrounds. So the SEED courses themselves, I don't anticipate there being any challenges. It would be the choice of stream that you would have to think through and you would be welcome to reach out to our uh, student advisor uh, to learn a little bit more about the specific um, uh, courses. We have two online. Uh, Monica, if you want to read them out. Sure, thanks for that. You guys can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So one student, it's kind of along the same lines with respect to maybe not having a specific engineering uh, degree. So one student is wondering if uh, the admissions committee will be considering applicants with BAs from the McGill School of Environment. So we have not at this point deliberated on that particular, so if it's a BA and there's not a strong scientific background, it might be more challenging. Um, what I would recommend, we, I, I believe that uh, we should examine the, their, um, we should take a bit of a closer look at the courses, but I would anticipate that it would be important to have some basic scientific courses. So if it's a BA that does not have a strong emphasis on science, it could be more challenging. In terms of cases that where there is some scientific uh, and, and mathematical foundations, uh, we, we will be discussing cases within the admission, admissions committee. So if there is, for example, someone who has a little bit heavier of a background in science, uh, certainly they will be adjudicated at that time. But we want to ensure that we're setting up the students for success. And many of the program courses do have a basis in uh, science and mathematics. Yeah, so along the same lines, maybe, um, I don't know if there's anything more to add to that answer, but just in case, uh, there's a student with a bachelor's of business administration and accounting uh, who has uh, two to three years of work experience in sustainable finance, and they are wondering if this uh, program, um, if they're eligible to apply to this program. That's a very good question, and also I know some bit of business administration uh, uh, courses or uh, programs actually do have very robust mathematics involved. What I would recommend for that student is to reach out uh, to me directly. Uh, and if there are some of you who sit on the fence, to reach out to myself and, and Gladys, our student program, so we can ask a little bit more about uh, what exactly the, uh, the courses that have been taken are, just so we can make sure we're making decisions that, again, set people up for success. Okay, perfect. And one more question. Um, I am in my final year of computer. Will I be disadvantaged if I do not have my fourth year grades since they are in progress? I do, do not believe at this time you will update. So you submit your transcripts as you have them, and then, uh, and then, and then the complete transcripts when they're completed. But uh, you'll be in the same situation as every other student who's applying from their fourth year. In terms of in terms of equivalency, or sorry, in terms of uh, ad, ad, admissions, I would say in general, the rule of thumb would be students with a background in science, mathematics, uh, those that are not in um, urban planning, uh, architecture, and engineering would be in general those that have a background in mathematics and sciences and computer science, those that are listed. But if you are if you feel quite strongly that you have the skills, then that's when I encourage you to reach out because at, at this point we do have the in brackets or equivalent. And that will, in my view, be taken very seriously as we review the applications. There's a question in the back here. Oh, so this is not about the TISED program, this is about...
So this here will show you the, you'll see the core courses right here. So these are the core courses. The core courses will be the core courses. Sorry? Okay, we have another question sure. Uh, so go ahead, Monica. Okay, one uh, participant is wondering, what are the typical response dates if we apply by the end of December? Maybe, maybe Gladys, I'm not sure if you can answer that one. To wait for the committee to meet uh, after the deadline. Okay. Did I hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So I guess I guess applying earlier doesn't mean an earlier response, right? We we wait for all the applications to come in before the committee. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, so there's something that I heard questions listed on the website. So um, there are complementary courses, but there's also an additional list of courses. And uh, I would suggest, so a, a lot of that will be at the discretion of the GPD, who is yours truly. Uh, and uh, I will be, uh, so I would essentially consider those on a case-by-case -case basis. But if there's a good reason for it, I don't, you know, certainly I see that as being an option. Okay, so just a, a follow up from the students. With respect to decision timelines, when can students expect to hear back with the, with the decision on their application? The general window would be between mid February and the end of April, just to make sure we clear everyone. Did you hear that? No, sorry, cannot. That was, that was hard to hear. Oh, uh, so it, the answer was by, uh, between mid-February and the end of April. I would just go with by the end of April uh, to be safe, uh, as we will have to meet and review all of the uh, all of the applications and adjudicate upon them once they are received. Yes. We're anticipating somewhere along the lines of 30, it would be my guess. Uh, so, but it would be, you, it's going to depend on the applications, how many we already have. Um, we're nearing that number already, but we're going to obviously have to adjudicate on them. So I would anticipate between 20 and 35, uh, depending on, um, on the applications and uh, the admissions committee. Yeah, I have one student who's wondering, um, they're currently in a PhD program in environmental engineering, um, Department of Engineering Processes. They're an international student and they're wondering if they can apply if they're currently in a PhD program. So I, do, I don't see why not. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I don't see why not if, you, if there is interest. So I'm not aware of anyone who's working specifically on marine shipping fuel, but that's interesting because we have had some interest. Uh, my group, for example, does do some work uh, looking at uh, shipping, for example, of liquefied natural gas. And, uh, but there's, of course, mechanical professors who will be working more specifically on 
propulsion systems and the like. So I would, I would encourage you to take a look through our TISED members and uh, gauge from that whether, whether there is someone who is, spe is specifically focused on, for example, a type of engine or a type of analysis tool that you're interested in. So on the TISED website, there's a, a, a long list of the members who are involved. As mentioned, there's quite a few faculty members involved with TISED. And so uh, the research-based courses, uh, students will be reaching out potent to pot perspective um, or to potential supervisors who might take them on for that research. So I, def I certainly encourage you to check uh, out the expertise and how it may align. And while, for example, if you're working in shipping and you're interested in examining two different types of systems, there could be someone who specifically focuses on an analysis tool which could be beneficial. Okay, we have a last question online. Uh, go ahead, Monica. Um, would you recommend this program straight from an undergrad degree or to those who have more experience in the work field first? I would argue both. I, I think that uh, from my perspective, I see the tools that uh, students will gain from this program coming out of their undergraduate degree, if they're interested in sustainability, will really provide them with an immense opportunity that's above what their undergraduate would uh, in terms of actually finding jobs that fit their interests because they'll have those skills. I'm also really looking forward to our industry liaison who will uh, really be really a key person to help connect students to industry and uh, government and other opportunities that could be of interest. For a more uh, seasoned professional, I see this as an excellent opportunity. For example, if you're in a particular career path, uh, but you've been interested in sustainability for a while as a way to gain the additional skills that would be of interest in the field. So I, I personally wouldn't recommend it for one or the other. I'd recommend it for both uh, for the specific situation of gaining uh, the, the necessary tools that you would have to be able to advance sustainability. Okay. And we have one last, last one. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Monica. Okay, we'll take, we'll take the last, last one. Um, is it possible for a student in other programs, such as Master of Management at McGill, to take some of the individual courses from, I guess I'm assuming the seed courses uh, from the program, and they're saying, by paying a fee to be clear. <laughs> well, this is a new question. I suspect it will have to go through some administrative discussions. Uh, the the uh, admission into the individual courses is by instructor approval, and it is uh, to uh, d uh, students in the Faculty of Engineering. Monica, do you have anything to add to that question? <laughs> I would uh, just advise the student to email our uh, student affairs administrator directly at grad.tysed at mcgill.ca. You can find that contact information online. And um, yeah, ask your questions and she, she could reply uh, you know, more comprehensively uh, via email. So you can see uh, our website and the email to, uh, to ask questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to yeah, emphasize. I would, I would drop them in the chat as well. Yeah, and I would emphasize again for those of you where there wasn't a direct question where we would require more information. For example, I am in a program uh, that has quite strong mathematics, uh, but I'm not sure if I'm exactly a right fit. Just reach out directly uh, so we can learn a little bit more and provide you with some advice specific to your case. And as well with any other question for that matter. That's good. Okay. Yeah. We can wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I believe uh, there's some uh, snacks here if you want to grab some uh, and some drinks. And thank you so much for coming. Do feel free to reach out. Gladys is here, who has is a wealth of information. Uh, so she's the one who's answering this, these emails. And, uh, and, and the profs will be around, hopefully, for a few minutes if you have any questions directly for them or about their courses. Thank you.